Hey everyone, uh, my name's Andy. I'm from the Finding Value uh, Finance channel. I've got Scott with us uh, from Sow and Reap Capital. Uh, he's a frequent um, frequent on the channel, so that's good. So thanks for coming on, Scott. Appreciate it. Uh, what we're going to talk about today is a recession, and I know there's a lot of recessionary fears in the market. A lot of people are talking about um, this next upcoming recession, and Scott and I, before this, before we started taping, we were trying to find a whole bunch of different correlations. We were looking at the previous recessions, 2000s, before the 2000s. Uh, whenever there was recessions, we were trying to see what was a leading indicator um, before the recession. We're, we were trying to, I think, basically find out what's a reliable indicator and what the sequence of events are or were. Um, and obviously, we're, we're trying to tie this together. It doesn't mean that we have it 100% right. But I think we have a couple of sequence of events that we want to talk about where they're basically leading indicators. Like, so, well, Scott will talk about it. I don't want to talk about too much. <laughs> Leave him uh, some meat on the bone here, <laughs> so to speak. But um, Scott, when we were looking at some stuff, what were you noticing in terms of the sequence of events before a recession happens, what 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 were you what were you seeing? Yeah, no, I, I think we just have to start thinking about it logically. Um, so let's say I um, I go to work and I earn money money, and like everyone else, you know, I've got mortgages to pay, for example. So so if you just think about it like that, obviously in, during the boom times, I'll be going out spending, 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 and I'll get more comfortable as my housing prices go up and as, as my asset prices go up, I'll get more comfortable to spend more and save less. And so I think the first sign, first really, earn, really early warning sign is really the dwindling of the personal savings rate. So I'll just share it with you my chart here. And so this is 2000, before the financial crisis of 2008, which was here. Let me just mark it here. So this was where the financial crisis was, basically around here. Um, we've seen savings dwindle down to pretty much nothing, 2%, 2% of the total um, income. And so we've seen it dwindle, 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 down to nothing. And so what happens then is, the second sequence of events you would expect to see is that my checkable deposit account, my savings account dwindles dwindle down to nothing as well, which is exactly what we've seen here. So you've seen the 2005 savings rate drop from around that area. And then you saw the save, uh, so you saw the amount of money in your checkable deposits and currency go down from 373 billion to 80 billion. So that's a significant drop, right? And then what happens is because I don't have money in the account <laughs> and I can't pay my mortgages, the next thing that you would expect to see is the delinquency rates start to, start to pick up. So this is delinquency rate on credit card. Uh, this is credit cards, but let me just give you all loans. And actually, credit card, let's just touch on that. Let's see what happens. So 2005, our savings rate dwindled, dwindled down to nothing. And then we started, started to see um, the credit card pick, credit card delinquency rates pick up, right? So it means people can't pay back my credit card. So if I'm consuming, I'm spending a lot because my asset prices went up and I'm happy and I'm saving less, your credit card all of a sudden becomes too much of a burden and you can't pay back your credit card, which is what we saw here. But let's look at, obviously credit card loans are a very small portion. And if you, if you are looking at delinquencies, I think the most relevant is all loans. <clears throat> And a lot, of it, a lot of this is mortgages and a lot of this is business loans, right? Because that's how the banking system is structured right now. Um, and so you see here, 2005, delinquency rates are really low because everyone's feeling good. Savings rate um, is dwindling down, starting to dwindle down. Everyone's feeling great about asset prices going up. And so you reach the lows here, but as your household deposit accounts here, you've seen it dwindle down to almost, almost nothing here. But around here is where it gets really low, right? So 2007, well, you go to 2007, your delinquency rate is basically telling you actually your um, savings rate have gone down, your checkable deposits, you, there's no money left in the, in the checkable deposits and people start defaulting on their loans and it starts to pick up and boom, there's a recession. 
But I guess one, one really important thing to note here is that it gives you plenty of warning, right? So you've started, <clears throat> so with the personal savings rate, let's just go back to the sequence of events. Um, so I, I drew a line here because I think this is almost looks like a key support in this chart. But the first time it came down below this level, really before the 2005, uh, 2008 financial crisis was down here. So in 2004 is when it first showed like a warning sign because this is a 2002 kind of deflationary pressure. This is the 2000 and prior to the 2008 financial crisis. And so 2004, it gave you like almost three, three and a half, four years warning before there, there was that deflationary pressure in the markets. And then the next one was the household deposits started dwindling down. It gave you an, even, uh, another, another warning. But then it, it's when the delinquency rates actually picked up from 06, Q2 06, there was a pretty significant pickup here. And you can see the rounding bottom here, as you saw the rounding bottom here. But I will get back to this. Um, but basically, you've seen early warning from 2006 to 2007. And so it gave you a total of about two years warning as well um, before we started seeing the delinquency rates being reflected in the market prices. That, I think that's, that's just what I've seen. Um, just logical, I guess, sequence of events. Yeah, I'm just trying to relate it back <clears throat> to today's market conditions because so back then we didn't have as much checkable deposits. We didn't have as much buffer in the savings accounts, so to speak, that's or right. checking accounts um, to buffer from a problem. But now we've got we've got a whole bunch of buffer. We've got, you know, a lot. In, in the accounts. Yeah. So do you think that that whatever has happened, you know, I know we've got a couple of declines in GDP in terms of quarters. Um, maybe technically it's co considered a recession, but are the conditions different this time than last time? Because we've got all this money in the in the checking accounts, so to speak, or checkable deposits. And the saving rate do you think we have further to fall before that really becomes a problem? Because we, we don't see a drawdown in the checkable deposits. All we see is the savings rate starting to decline. And Which theoretically still means that people are saving money and increasing the amount of money in the, in the checkable deposit mm -hmm. accounts, right? Because you got to remember, although the savings rate has dropped, it's still, I mean, we're coming from a ridiculous high level where everyone basically did nothing, nothing from home. And like they were just saving whatever they earned, right? So we're talking about 33%. That's like almost China, China level of savings, right? Um, <clears throat> but you're talking about still 5% of savings, which is, you know, it, it's, it's well, um, if, you, if you go back to the 2000s, for example, we had like savings rate of 5% in 2003, like five years before the financial crisis. So we're still, uh, people are still saving money. And yeah, I, th I think we've got a huge buffer, which makes it very different this time around. Because, I mean, when they had no savings here, like they had very little buffer in their accounts. But if you see this, they've got heaps of, <laughs> heaps of buffer in their accounts right now. So I think it's very different. And I think because of the buffer, I think it will, it will take a lot longer for it to be reflected in the delinquency rates. Because before someone becomes delinquent, they, they, um, they must miss out on many payments, right? But because of all this cash buffer, um, I, I think you know, it will take a lot longer for, for them to um, start defaulting on their loans, basically. Yeah, I would, I mean, also, I mean, if you think about it, if you have a lot of money sitting in your bank, why would you increase your savings rate if you already feel like you have adequate savings? Yep. So I think there's that That's going right. on as well, where you're just like, you know, whatever. And then you, we got all this money too. And I wonder if there's any ramifications with people buying a lot of stuff kind of in 2020, 2021. And now they're just like, ah, whatever. I don't need to buy anything. Like they're just kind of burnt yep. out or, or, or just not spending as much maybe I, perhaps. Yep, that's right. But, but this is really um, what we were talking about before as well, Andy, right? In terms of the real mm -hmm. negative GDP, because I mean, people are calling this recession, maybe rightly so. Um, but here, if you look at this, this, this is a, these are, this shows uh, different components of GDP, right? So if you look at the top here, if you look at here, it says personal expenditure has actually gone up 
So it's not the personal expenditure that's gone down in terms of real GDP, despite like close to 10% inflation, right? Despite, <laughs> so, so people are out there spending a lot more basically in terms of nominal dollar value. Uh, what's declined though, um, we noted was really the real government consumption expenditure and gross investment. So it, it's the government spending that's gone down in real terms, not nominal terms, but in real terms. Because if you look at this, it's sitting at what, three point, what is this measuring? $3.3 trillion, I think. And then down here, it's got 3.34. It's come down from 3.36 uh, here to 3.318. Uh, so it's really the government, real government consumption expenditure that seems to have gone down. But if you look at government... Do you, do you think that's on purpose? Do you think, is that considered inflating your debts away or inflating your... your I mean, because... We're seeing it go up in nominal terms, but it's going down in real terms. Yes. Do, do you think that's being done on purpose? Do you, do you think that's the whole purpose of all this inflation? Is that- What do you that, mean by that? Well, maybe perhaps that government consumption or government expenditures, yep. they're trying to decline the government expenditures in real terms. Yep, they could be. They're inflating- Because obviously the inflation's- Yep, they're inflating their, um, we'll call it, they're they're inflating their quote problems away, <laughs> their their yeah, their yeah. Uh, their liabilities. So yeah, so so as you can see on this chart, real government consumption. This is real, right? So this is nominal government consumption expenditures and gross investments minus the inflation rate. So it, you can see a bit of a downtrend here. But what's really interesting that we found, Andy, was oh, this is real. Sorry. If you just look at the nominal terms, you don't see a slowdown in government spending. It's just like a, it's just it's just a continued move up. So it's really just the inflation rate that's affecting everything right now. But who knows, right? Who knows what's going to happen going forward? I mean, if, if inflation rate were to come down, then we could see a real growth in GDP potentially, um, or government can spend even more, um, even more money. Like I mean. Theoretically, it's a separate entity, right? So mm -hmm. governments around the world right now to try and stimulate the economy the other way um, are introducing a lot of infrastructure projects. And, and we don't see signs of a slowing down in, in terms of US Treasury spending uh, and budgets um, when you look at their budgets, right? So annual budgets, for example, um, you don't really see a sign of slowing down. So, you know, um, they, it could continue on its very, very um, high... Um, increase trajectory level so i don't well, I'm, know I'm, tr I'm trying to understand this if so we are we are the gdp is going down when accounted for inflation yes. so it, it, it it's pulling back only because of the inflation rate when it's yes. taken out when you look at it from a nominal perspective everything is still going up that's right so what ramifications does a technical recession necessarily have then? Because if everything's going up and they say, well, real terms, it's, it's, it's we're contracting. Uh, but we don't see it in unemployment necessarily, do we? No. So yeah. basically what, 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 what's happening, I think, is people are just getting poor. I mean, is, is that kind of what's happening? Would you say like, so. like our, our wages are so. just not accounting for the inflation? So it's our yep, real GDP is right. going down, but it, it kind of has to at some point. We're just, I mean, literally it's just telling us we're getting poorer. <laughs> to some I extent. think so. I think so. And, um, and, and as, feel, as people feel the pressure of inflation, I think they need to start buying assets again, right? Because right now we're, we're in a risk off environment, but as they really start feeling the pain, I think they will need to try and store um, their value, right? Of what, what they have right now by buying assets basically. And I think it's going to be a risk on environment again soon. And, and this, is, this is what you mean, Andy, by gross domestic product. I mean, like in, in nominal terms, it's just continuing its upward trajectory. Um, it hasn't been declining at all. So, and, and if you look at the 2008 financial crisis, for example, it did go down in nominal terms. And if you look at the 2020, um, the medical event crash, it did go down in nominal terms. We're not seeing it go down in nominal terms. It's just that inflation rate is really high that, in real terms, it's going down. But as you yeah. said, like, what does that mean? <clears throat> well, I was, I was going to 
say something because uh, when the delinquency rates were going down and and people couldn't afford their mortgages, they obviously were not invested in uranium because during that time, that's when uranium went ballistic was in that 04, 05, 06, 07 timeframe. So that's right. Yeah. If you were a uranium investor, you'd be able to afford your house because you would have just made a copious amounts of money on that, on those investments. <laughs> that's true. That's true. So, here, so here's it, another, it, here, here's, here's something I want to make a comment on that hopefully everybody understands. So we want to, we, we're going over this and this is the reason we're going over this. So, so like with a fine tooth comb, so to speak, and getting the logic, the, the uh, events, right. The, this, the logical sequence of events is because our commodity stocks go up right before a recession. Like that is, it's, everyone's going to tell you, we're going to go into a recession. You got to sell everything. But here's the problem. Uranium went ballistic when all the numbers were telling you that we were slowing down in 05, 05, 06, 07. It was all slowing down at that time. And that's when uranium did a 20 bag. Right now, we've got similar market conditions to the 2000s. So things are slowing down, but we're looking at all the data and we're saying, well, you know, this still has legs in it. And the reason that's so important is because the uranium bull market can happen when it quote still has legs in it, <laughs> like that's when it it goes ballistic. So it's 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 difficult because everybody gets so scared, but that's when uranium and oil and natural gas all go ballistic. Is they go they go right before the recession occurs. It's a late stage um, investment where inflation still in the system. People are now rotating money away from it because of increasing interest rates. And I think, it, it, and really, I think the entire bull market of uranium happened when, when almost, they just started almost ending the, the interest rate increase and it was going sideways. Like yeah. that was like the whole bull market. So I think if you were to look at the conditions today and you were to look at the conditions before, they're all very similar uh, to when uranium goes ballistic and other, and other yeah. commodities. So. And, and all the, also, I mean, just a big difference here right now is that um, we've got so much more money on the sidelines, not just your households, but commercial banks as well. Like commercial banks have unprecedented level of cash on the sidelines. Um, hedge funds have a lot of cash on the sidelines. So I feel like it's a combination of the conditions that are similar, because obviously with commodities, usually they are late cycle runners, right? Because towards the end of a boom, that's when the commodities typically run. And so we, we are towards the end of this cycle in that Andy and I do expect the deflationary pressure, you know, a couple of years down the road. We don't know exactly when we'll have to observe the data. We have to see the, the savings rate dwindle even further. We need to see um, the checkable deposits account come down a little bit further. We need to see delinquencies pick up and so on. But we do expect a de uh, deflationary pressure a couple of years down the road. And we are late in the cycle, which is when commodities typically run. Um, so I think we have the conditions for it, plus the money on the sidelines, plus the ESG movement. Because I think one thing that's really missing in a lot of the conversations is really, I mean, we, we talk about ESG, but ESG, I think, could be the next big thing, right? Because climate change, I'm hearing, you know, I'm hearing from like various media outlets and stuff like that, that if we don't act now, then we, we're no, never going to tackle climate change. And I think climate change, because if you look at the financial services industry, for example, and the banks and where they can invest, it's all about ESG. <laughs> all the discussions at the annual general meetings, for example, it's all about ESG, how ESG conscious they are, whether the banks are invested in you know, oil and gas companies and coal companies that are dirty. Um, so all the com right conversations are happening. And I think money, the investable money has to flow into something that's ESG friendly. And I can't think of a better one than nuclear power. I mean, Australia's just also started talking about nuclear power yesterday, right? We, we don't, we produce zero electricity from nuclear power right now, but, you know, we are starting that conversation. The entire world, if you look at Germany, for example, <laughs> they are in big trouble. You know, there was like, um, Amir's, uh, hold on, let me share this tweet. Because this was really, I mean, when you read stuff like this, like it's really becoming real. So this is, Amir Nani, I think he's the CEO of UEC, Uranium Energy Corporation. And um, yeah, he says, Germany heading to guest emergency with Russia keeping Nord Stream flow reduced. 
Germany's presidential palace in Berlin is no longer lit at night. <laughs> presidential palace <laughs> is no longer lit at night. City of Hanover is turning off warm water in the showers of its pools and gyms. That's just the beginning, right? So we haven't even hit winter. <laughs> Yeah. And we're going through stories like this. I mean, what are they going to do if they, if Russians like actually just cut everything off? I mean, and, and this really highlights the fact that the nations, right, the governments around the world really need to secure their own supply of energy. It's a national, it's a matter of national security. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so, and, and, and nuclear power, because it's so condensed, like you can store in warehouses, right? Rather than having to like ship a bunch of stuff. Like if you think about the logistics of it, like it's probably the simplest form of energy in that it's most condensed. You can store it in a warehouse, lock it away. Um, and, and you can store many, many years worth of supply in, in, in just a warehouse. Whereas with coal, like you need all the space. You need, I mean, and, and forget about talking about the renewables because it's so mineral intensive as you always talk about. <laughs> like the time that it takes to build all that and the land, amount of land that you require to build all that and um, extra buffer that you need to build because it's so inconsistent in, in terms of the delivery of energy. Um, it, it's just not a viable solution. So I think everyone's going to wake up to this. And I think, yeah, the stories for nuclear are just getting more bullish um, every day. Every single day, there's a, new, a bullish news that comes out and it, it's mega bullish. <laughs> yeah, I think the problems that they'll run into is if you try to source all these minerals around the world for renewables, uh, they're going to be in a lot of areas where they're not secure to get a reliable source of those minerals. Uh, so if you're at war with China and they've got 99% of rare earth metal processing, uh, you kind of take that entire thing out. <laughs> you're like, hey, we're or like, if we're at war with Russia or China or whatever, you think we're going to send all these rare earth metals for them to process it and then return it back? <laughs> no, they're not going to do that. So I, I think my opinion is they're going to have to st restart these nuclear power plants and they're going to have to build new ones. So, and it's not a matter of a want, it's a matter of like, if we, if we want this energy, we have to go this route. It, they're, they're not going to send these things over to China necessarily. I mean, they will, it, as long as people are, you know, acting all right with each other, the, the countries. But if we go to war, or if something happens, that, that may be taken off the table, potentially. So then, and then nuclear is going to be in the news everywhere. I mean, this is just going to be like the biggest FOMO trade uh, out there because people would be watching the news and then, you know, grandma, whoever is watching it, like, I think we should invest in some uranium. <laughs> or a nuclear and then boom all this money starts coming because they see it on the news right so the smallest sector ever right yep huge opportunities i think to just sit i think so and yep. yeah and i don't know maybe the conditions i think are better this time around than pre-2000s as well like i mean just in terms of cash as i talked about like i mean if you think about how much the cash dwindled down to like it, it dwindled down to 80 billion dollars across the households and and non-profit organizations, whereas now we're sitting at like 4.4 trillion. Like how long would it take? I mean, there might be recessions, there might be slow, slow down, well, and maybe a little bit of uptick in unemployment rates, but without the uptick in delinquencies, because if you look at history, delinquencies always happen before unemployment picked up, which makes sense, right? So banks start losing money, um, you know, business start losing money. And so they, you know, um, going to delinquency, that's the first sign, and then they start firing mm -hmm. their people. So if I think about the amount of cash that the households and the banks have right now, I think we could potentially continue on with this um, bull market in commodities for a little bit longer than the 2000s even. And, and, and combine that with inflation, inflationary pressure, people are starting to jump into hard assets and also people just getting into speculative assets because it's providing returns like you've seen in like cryptocurrencies, for example, because we, I'm expecting cryptocurrency type of, price movement, uranium, and people will start chasing it. Um, so if you combine those factors, I think we're just in for a huge bull market. I, I want to share something too here. I've got a, yeah. an article that I just want to share real quick. Um, I'm going to read it. It's right in the middle here. Uh, this is the figure here that I want to talk about. 
Um, it says figure, figure two shows that historically there is an extremely high correlation between world energy consumption and the total quantity of goods and services produced by the world economy. In my analysis, I use purchasing power parity GDP because it is not distorted by the rise and fall of the US dollar relative to other currencies. And what she is talking about is the correlation between the two. The R squared value is 0.9942. And what that means in, in a linear relationship, when you do a, a curve fitting and you match it to a curve, an R squared value over 80% is a pretty good match. It explains the movement with 80% confidence. This is basically saying that there's a direct correlation between world energy consumption and GDP. Like, and there's like with a 99% confidence level. And what I think might happen going forward is if we have an energy crisis, which we're in, and you start to dwindle your energy down, your GDP will go it technically into a recession because there's not enough energy to, to support the GDP growth. So now you're, 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 you're basically constraining the entire system uh, of energy, which is going to be recessionary. So the, 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 the way that I look at this and respond to this is if GDP and energy are tied together 90, with 99% confidence level and you have an energy constraint, what that means is your GDP will be held down because of energy. And depending on what the markets do, they have to grow. Their, uh, their M2 money supply has to grow. Otherwise, you will have a problem. That is the design of the system. But if you can't grow GDP, you're going to get into inflation rate problems. So it is at, at the utmost concern of the money manipulators or controllers, uh, because that's where they get all their power, that they fix this energy problem immediately. And I'm sure they're going to do it at any cost. Doesn't matter. I want solutions, get energy out there, uh, because otherwise their currency, which gives them power and control, uh, will have problems. Yes, exactly right. And, and what you've mm -hmm. talked about there is actually, this is a real example of what can happen because obviously with Germany going through energy crisis and more than others right now. I mean, it says how Germany industry plans to cut its gas consumption. And basically Mercedes-Benz right now is saying, the head of Mercedes-Benz announced that the company was preparing to reduce its natural gas consumption in Germany by as much as 50%, right? So if you don't have energy, you don't produce anything. <laughs> Right. How do you produce anything? Right. So, so when, 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 when they're talking about a recession, oh no, we've got a recession. I'm like, yeah, we've got an energy crisis. What do you expect? I mean, it's going to happen. Yep. It's, it's energy crisis that are driving the recession. And, 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 and yep, go for it. And sorry, where does the money go <laughs> when you've got a problem like this? You're, you're going like to buy goods and services, it, inflation. More money chasing and, and goods. Money is, well, you, you say this all the time, Andy. Money is going to go to a place where there is a problem and it's going to be energy, right? Yeah. It's going to go into oil, gas, um, all these companies, and also nuclear. Because they'll realize this is this, I think this is a moment where they realize the world needs nuclear power. Like oil and gas are pretty much done in terms of, you know, I mean, if they can't, I mean, they can't try and implement ESG measures and and also expect, you know, um, e a supply of oil and gas because they just don't go hand in hand together, right? So they will need to um, source or go for an alternate source of energy and that's going to be nuclear. So this is it. This is it. It is. And all the problems, yeah. again, the, the, the majority of money is going to go to solve all the problems. And if this is the biggest yeah. problem, this is the, also, the, also the biggest opportunity. Yes, I think so. So I, I don't have anything else, Scott. You got anything else that you'd like to share? No, um, no, I don't actually. <laughs> you don't? You're good? All right. Yes, I'm good. Well, that's all I've got, guys. Ho hopefully that's all that Scott's got. But um, if you guys want to follow Scott, so in Reap Capital, if you want to follow me, uh, Twitter and my website, yeah, that one. Uh, if you want to become a Platinum member, just go over there. You can get a bunch of, bunch of this information uh, on the website. All right, guys, uh, that'll do it for us, at least for today. Uh, we'll catch you next time. 
uh, on some later videos that we do together. And that's all I've got. So thanks for coming on, Scott. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me.